One of the most fascinating things is about the ministry of Jesus. I never get tired of reading it, the way he went about things, the things that he did do. And I always ponder upon the question why he did what he did and how he did it. And I like today to stand still a little bit with this. His touch, he had a way of touching. It's fascinating. He was a carpenter. His hands would have been quite rough, actually, unlike the other rabbis. He was a tradesman. He was accustomed to heavy work. The Gospels, the Gospels use the word for hands and fingers and touch in regards to the ministry of Jesus, all four Gospels, they mention it nearly 200 times. Did you know that? I didn't quite realize that. It's quite fascinating. Let's start with the one in the Gospel of Mark. There was a leper who came to him imploring him. Now here is the scenery. This is a leper who's supposed to be separated from the people. He broke the quarantine's rules and came straight to Jesus. Luke says, the physician Luke says he was full of it, full of leprosy. Leprosy is a terrible disease. It still actually is in a few hundred countries. It's quite fascinating. There are still thousands of new cases, but it's more containable and treatable. Known as the Hansen's disease, it is a scaling effect that is the first visible part and then it deadens the nerve ends and so you have no feeling and then ultimately it leads to the loss of the extremities, uh, the, the, the tremendous, um, what shall I say, deformities that you can get out of this, make them a horrible sight, festering skin, etc. They lived in separation. They were away from society, you understand. They really, really suffered not just the disease, but you were a complete outcast. Complete. And there's another angle to it, which I'll develop on in a minute. He came to him, he was imploring Jesus, kneeling down to him, and this is what he said to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I, I wonder if you could look at that last word. He doesn't say you can heal me, you can what? Ah. There was a, an, an angle to having this particular disease I want to dwell on. He comes to Jesus because he believes that Jesus can do it. Not since the days of Naaman, 800 years ago, before this encounter, had been anybody cured of leprosy. He comes to Jesus and he asks to be clean. And that is fascinating. The disease from a physical perspective, absolutely repulsive. It was incurable. It was a one-way street a dismal darkness ahead of you. It was isolating. You're away from family. By the way, the disease was actually passed on airborne. Not so much by touching, but that could affect you too, but it was airborne. It was isolating. You could only congregate this likewise afflicted. Touching a leper would make you unclean absolutely unclean. And the physical counterpart to the spiritual problem of sin. You understand, they viewed it as the finger of God, the finger of God. In other words, if you were afflicted of leprosy, you were not just an outcast of society, you were also an outcast from God. Do you understand that? Yes. This is very important. You had nothing to hope for. And you certainly had nothing to live for. Terrible, 
terrible destiny, terrible. So he comes to Jesus, and then Jesus, and I love what Mark says here, moved with compassion. If there is one word to describe the ministry of Jesus, one word, compassion. And we have to be come like Jesus. Do you get that? To have compassion for your fellow man is our first and foremost pursuit. That is what we must have. He stretched out his hand and he what? He touched him. He touched him. He broke the rules. He now would become unclean, certainly ceremoniously unclean. But yes, but it didn't stop him from touching him. Why did Jesus do what he didn't have to do? He didn't have to touch him, but he did. I often wonder about that. And he said to him this. This is what he said to him. I am willing. Now remember he had asked for cleansing. He says, I am willing, be what? Be cleansed. It wasn't just a physical healing. It was a spiritual healing. Do you understand this? Often we feel when something happens to us that somehow God is repaying us for deeds done wrong. And we can all think of a few, can't we? Yeah. Yes, me too. And so, and so here is the promise of Jesus. He says, I will not just remove the physical, I will remove the spiritual. Every time that Jesus healed, Every time that he removed an ailment, a disease that was incurable and regarded as a punishment of God, he pronounced forgiveness. He announced restoration in their relationship with God. Do you understand this? And this perhaps is the most important aspect and perhaps the best explanation why Jesus spent far more time healing than he did preaching. As soon as he has spoken, I love this, how long did it take? Immediately. I wish I could have been a witness, an eyewitness to this wonderful deed that he did do. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Beautiful. This man needed more than physical healing. He had a need as an outcast. He needed to be touched, and that is why Jesus, in his compassion, touched him. He touched him, he touched him, because nobody else would. You understand? He touched him, he touched him, because he loved him. Compassion. This is where you and I need to go to become Christ-like. And so, the story of the ten lepers. I love that story. I want you to pay attention there because there's a question coming up. How many? Ten. Ten. They were crying out to Jesus. They had observed the regulation of observing distance. Jesus was going through Galilee, through the uh, district on the border there with Samaria, and he went into a city, and they were crying out to him. They kept that distance, because that was mandatory. And as they cried out, as they cried out, Jesus replied. And what did Jesus say? Does anybody know what the direction of Jesus was? What did he say? Ah, he told them, listen to this, they're lepers. They're still lepers. 
and he tells them to go to the priest to be pronounced cured, disease-free. Now, I wonder if you can appreciate what he is asking. And I think there's an important message here. When he asks you, when God asks you to be holy, and you're not, and you know it. Don't stand there and do nothing. Had they done that, if they would have stood there and waited until they would be cured, they would have died of the disease. But a remarkable thing, all 10 of them, they went. And you can imagine that as they went, as they went, the interesting thing is this, as they went, there were still lepers when they left, but as they went, the healing found place. They started to look at their hands, they started to look at each other, they started to look at their feet, they started to look at their arms, and they were realizing, they were realizing that the disease was leaving them. They were being cured. And I can imagine that they started off. And as they were more made healthy, I would say they would have run the last few kilometers. Because what does it mean? It means to be cured. It means to be right with God. It means they could see their families again. They could embrace their loved ones again. Huge, enormously, the impact, life-changing. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back before he saw the priest. Before human approval, he needed to do something. And you know the story. He comes back and with a loud voice, he is glorifying God. Because there was only one who could cure you. That was God. Now they had that faith in Jesus. They asked him to do it. And he realized the incredible gift that was given to him. An incredible gift. He came to Jesus and he fell on his feet. He fell on his feet and he gave him thanks. And this is what Jesus said to him. By the way, this one was a... The others were Jewish. They could have claimed some right, perhaps, being descendants from Abram being the chosen people, this Samaritan, when he was amongst the ten, because it united them in their affliction, he still knew that he was an outcast as well from the Jewish commonwealth. Had less entitlement, and he realized that. But he was so grateful, so grateful, his choice was to thank him. Here is a lesson. How often have you not gotten on your knees and you pray? Lord, restore me. It's your health, maybe. Maybe it's personal problems. Maybe it's a relationship. And so you pray. And then as you pray, you pour out your heart because you know he can help. And then he helps. How many times and with what intensity did you thank him? And by the way, did your thankfulness show in your life? We often don't do that. We often don't do that. Jesus said to him, arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. There were instances that it was demonstrated that the petitioners had the faith in Jesus, but not always. 
Not always. That faith that made you well, the word for well, it's a Greek word here, so I don't know what Hebrew or Aramaic word he would have used, but it is a wholesomeness beyond the physical, you understand. I like this one. And so I noted the reference there on the bottom. Nine reasons why the Jewish lepers did not return and give thanks. Only one of them did. Now, I wonder if you could identify with any of the reasons. And I'd like to give you nine reasons here. Nine. One waited to see if it was real. I mean, is it true? Am I healed? The other one waited to see if it would last. Maybe it would come back. Better give it a bit of time. The other one, one was going to see Jesus later. I think that's a very common one. He grants you petition and you will thank him in the near future, which is still forthcoming. The other one, the other one decided, he decided that he possibly didn't have leprosy. It might have been something like leprosy. Um, uh, one said, uh, well, he might have gotten well anyway. Here's another one. Here's another one. One said, oh, well, Jesus didn't do all that much. He only said it. Here's another one. One gave the glory to the priest. Thank you, thank you, thank you. They're thanking the wrong person. And here's a good one. One said, oh, well, any rabbi could have done that. Minimizing what he's done for you. And I did this last one. One of them said, well, I was improving already anyway. Can you identify with any of those statements why you neglected to thank Jesus for what he's done in your life? Those who forget to thank God for blessings received and forget truly to appreciate what God has done for them, notice, are in grave danger of forgetting him altogether. Can you remember that? Folks, can you remember that? This is a vital, vital reality. Now, I love the one at the pool of Shiloam. It comes from the verb shalach, which means to send. It means being sent. That's the picture here of the, the one that, where they found it, and of course that was full of water here. The pool of Siloam. Here we have uh, a blind man. And here Jesus has a most unusual procedure. He spits on the ground, that's all dusty. Then he mixes it up. You'd say hardly hygienic, but he mixes it all up into some sort of a clay. And then he applies it on his eyes. I'm still wondering why he did it that way. Yeah. There is maybe a spiritual application. What comes out of his mouth, the words of life, applied to the eyes gives him the sight. I'm just now speculating. I'm not being dogmatic about it. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And then he sends him. That's where the word comes from. Then he sends him to the pool of Shalom. And as he does do that, as he does do that, he came back seeing. Now you say, that's fantastic. Whatever stopped him from seeing was repaired and restored. But here is something you need to understand. Little babies have eyesight, but they have no interpretive capacity. They're not interpreting what they're seeing. There are pathways, neural pathways, between the retina and the brain that have to be developed over years. So you can focus, interpret, and then, of course, assess what you're seeing. That is a process that takes years. That was instant. That was 
instant in this case because this man had been blind from birth. Unlike some of the others that develop the blindness, this one never had learned as a child, as a baby, to see. Do you understand this? This is a huge miracle. It's incredible. Only the creative power of God could have done that. There's a dialogue, you want to read that, in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John. There's a dialogue between the Pharisees and this man. And even the parents of this man become involved, affirming that he had been blind from, from his birth. And they asked him again how he received his sight. They wanted to know, because this was on the Sabbath, of course. They wanted to know, but they knew already that there was one person and one person only who could do this. But they wanted to hear it from him. What do you say about him because he opened your eyes? Oh, that's an interesting question. What do you think he said? He said he is a prophet. Now, this is interesting. He did not know that it was Jesus who had opened his eyes. Do you understand? He didn't know that. He didn't know. And they cast him out because in the conversation they repeat the question. And he said, I've already told you what he did. Do you want to become his disciples as well? And they were so offended they cast him out. I love the follow-up. A lesson to any practitioner of health. There needs to be a follow-up. He had, Jesus, had attended to the blind man's physical need, but he didn't stop that. Jesus met him. He made sure he spoke to him because he was now going to attend to his spiritual need. Do you believe in the Son of God? And the man said, who is it, Lord, that I might believe him? And then Jesus says this, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking to you. Isn't that amazing? That would have been some experience. The Son of God, the Messiah. <coughs> Pardon me. Jesus says, I am he. And he believed. He expressed his belief. And he worshipped him. I think this is a beautiful story. Marvelous account. The man with dropsy. Does anybody know what the disease dropsy is? No? Uh. It's not dropping things. <laughs> it's an abbreviated form of hydrodropsy, and there's a longer word for it. It is a no, no, good try. It's not what it is. It is when the body fluids do not go back into the circulative system, lymphatic or circulation. It means that there is fluid build up in the tissues, intercellular tissues. And if you press a skin of someone that has dropsy, they have very swollen extremities, the imprint stays. It takes a long time before it goes. It affects, it affects the skin conditions. Ulcers are not being cured. It is a most terrible disease, and it changes you into a very grotesque appearance. Now, look at this. Again, a Sabbath. It happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath. There are seven healings that are recorded in the gospel that happened on the Sabbath. You understand, as far as the Pharisees were concerned, yes, it was permitted to do good. But when it came to chronic diseases, if you healed them on the Sabbath, you were transgressing the Sabbath because you could either day, do it the day before or the day after there was no emergency. And the argument they had with Jesus that he did it on a number of occasions on the Sabbath. Get it? And so, it happened as he went into the house of one of the Pharisees, one of, he was invited there, he was invited there, they watched him closely. Why did they watch him closely? 
not because to learn from him if they could find fault in him. And was the man of drop suffering the dropsy, was the man planted, if you know what I mean? Was he planted? And behold, there was a certain man uh, before him, Jesus, with that terrible disease called dropsy. And the Greek says, he took him, at, in fact, he embraced him. Now, you would not an attractive person to hold. But here again, you have the compassion of Christ. He embraces him. He didn't have to do that, but he did. He took hold of him, he healed him, and then he sent him away to make sure there was no argument about the Sabbath that might dampened the tremendous incredible relief can you imagine that jesus embraces that person he instantly heals him and he walks away normal great isn't it what a story that would have been what a story the daughter of Jairus. i've just get a collection here there's so many the daughter of Jairus, I, I find that fascinating. He went in, took her by the hand, and the girl arose. We have here the perception that death is asleep. And he, 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 he walks into that room with the parents and the three disciples that he selected. And he tells that Tabitha Kum, that's an Aramaic young girl, stand up and, and, and she does. And I like this little touch. She stands up, or she comes, she rises back to life, and then he turns to the parents and he says, you better give her something to eat. I like that. I like a savior that knows we need to eat. Do you understand? What a humanity, I, I, I love that. The two blind men, again, this happened in Galilee. Two blind men walk up to Jesus. Two blind men, they followed him. And notice, crying out. They are crying out and saying, they're pleading with him. Uh, Son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David, they identify him as the Messiah. Because that was one of the messianic titles. And Jesus, he tests their face. He says, do you believe I can do this? And they say, yes, Lord, they really believe it. They're not saying it because they have nothing to lose. They say it because they believe it. Then he touched their eyes. He could have spoken, but he didn't. He touched their eyes according to your faith. Let it be done to you. And an instant cure finds place. Remember the son of the woman from Nain, it was one of the little Galilean cities. She was a widow. And her one son had died. That means her prospect of being cared for in her old age had died. Do you understand? <coughs> Jesus walked up to the procession, funeral procession, there's an open carrying, and he touches the actual, the Bible says an open coffin, whatever form that was. So, so the party stops. Then he turns to the woman and he says, do not weep. And then he turns to the one who had died and he tells him, young man, I say to you, arise. Look at this, he's dead. Can he hear? But the voice of Jesus will be heard by all the dead. All. When they come back at the resurrection, it will be heard. I say to you, arise. So he who was dead, he sat up and he begins to speak. And Jesus restored him to the mother, restoring her hope. And you can imagine the joy that would have been there. Did he know he was walking into a funeral procession? Was he directed by the Holy Spirit? Most likely. 
But it is a wonderful thing that the compassion compelled him. Compassion compels. It is far more than just a feeling. I love this one at Bethesda. Bethesda means house of mercy. How long had that man been like that? No, not all his life. No, no, you're wrong there. Does anybody know how many years he had been like that? 38, very good. That's not his age. He had been lying there for 38. Here is another thing. He was there because of his own sin. We would say because of his own stupidity. Somehow we have the feeling when somebody is afflicted because of something silly, dumb that they did do, just deserve. Jesus doesn't think like that. That's the important message. He doesn't think you deserve it, even if you did. The greatest suffering of that man, this, by the way, illustration is by a man called Harry Anderson, who made some magnificent illustrations. If ever you Google his name, it's fantastic. This man would have suffered from the realization that his sin put him in that position. And he's lying there year after year after year, totally reliant on the charity of others for his sanitary cleansing, for his, for, his, for his food, for his sustenance, totally dependent on the mercy of others, but nobody to help him into the water that sometimes moved, it wasn't a Titian well, that sometimes would move. What I'm interested in is this. Jesus asked him this question. He says, do you want to be made well? He's not saying, do you want to walk again? He says, do you want to be made well? It is beyond the physical. And then he tells him, now you've got to understand this. This man does not know who is speaking to him. He sees a sympathetic face. He sees a compassionate face. But he has no idea of who's speaking to him. And suddenly then this stranger says, get up and walk. And he does. He could have reasoned, oh, no way. And he'd be still lying there for the next 38 years, if he had that. He gets up, he gets up immediately, and he walks, he probably jumps 38 years later. Incredible, incredible. Took up his bed and walked and got into trouble with the Pharisees, why? What was that day? Sabbath. Oh, it was the Sabbath day. And he was carrying, he was carrying his bed. See, that's his bed. When we talk about a bed, it's not a mattress from Bing Lee or... Oh, they don't sell mattresses, do they? Sleep master or whatever. I don't even know where you buy those things. And then Jesus sees him later, after he's been told off by the Pharisees, and this is what he said. See, you have been made well, but sin no more. Just because Jesus forgives you, just because he restores you, doesn't give you a license to reoffend. You understand this? This is important. Lest a worse thing comes upon you. And there's a warning from Jesus himself. I like this statement. And it will appeal to you if you have, in your desperation, knelt before him. God changes caterpillars into butterflies. He sent into pearls, coal into diamonds, using time and pressure. Life is a struggle, guys. And that statement is wonderful. He is working on you too. If you are struggling, you're not losing. He is working on you through time and pressure. And that comes from Rick Warren. I love this statement from Jeremiah, be still, to be still. Sometimes we'll have to learn to be still. For I know the plans I have for you, declares God. 
plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And God has those plans for each and every one here. Never think any differently. If he grants you life, he has plans. I like this statement by Nelson Mandela. It always seems impossible, he says, until it's done. Isn't that true? That is so true. I love this one that Paul made. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Everything is possible with God. And we got to believe that. And then the healing, becoming well, becomes a part of our life. What greater story is the one of the Samaritan? It really the parable of the Samaritan, and I'm out of time here, is really an account of the mission of Jesus, rightly understood. That was his mission. He was forsaken for a moment that we might not for a moment ever be forsaken. Don't you like that statement? So true, so true. Jesus, compassion. The two go together. But here a sound of warning from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Lutheran pastor that was, uh, he was actually executed by the Nazis a month or two before they surrendered to the Allied forces. Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of our church. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. He says, baptism without church, bap uh, church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipline. That is what he says. Grace without the cross and grace without Jesus Christ incarnate and living. It's a sound of warning. When God restores us, we may not only fail to express our gratitude, but in so doing, we also run the risk of cheapening the action of restoration itself. In other words, the sin doesn't appear to be so sinful, and yet it is. And if ever it wears you out, at my lowest, God is my hope. At my weakest, God is my strength. At my saddest, God is my comforter. And remember, whatever your situation, God will take you through places you don't understand now. You don't understand just to bring you to the place where he wants you to be. You just have to, you and I, have to trust him. And that is really most of the message this morning. His touch, his touch will make you whole. And with this you have to remember, the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And the God of the good times is the God of the bad times, the tough times. And the God of the day is also the God of the night. He will touch you, each and every one of us here, and he has already, I'm sure you're here. But he wants to touch you, to make you stronger. But he'll only do it if you let him. Do you understand? You have to let him. You have to be willing to be strengthened by him. And that may well mean to be changed by him. May God bless you. Heavenly Father, it is good to be here this morning with our church family. Thank you for the gift that we are to one and another and thank you for the gifts that you have imparted to so many and a willingness to serve. Above all, we thank you for your presence. Really, what is mankind that you are mindful of him? And yet, as we look at Jesus, we see the enormity of the compassion that he holds for us. How could we ever think that we are not loved? Because we are. We dear precious in his sight and your sight. Thank you for being our heavenly father. Lord, bless us. 
make us strong. And if we need to change, help us to let him touch us so we may be what you want us to be. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. I did forget to pray for the food, so I might do that as well. Sorry about that. Heavenly Father, as we partake of the fellowship and the, the food, we ask for the blessing of the food. Be grateful in a land of plenty that we live. Bless this gathering, bless this fellowship. In Jesus' precious name, amen.